So theme 40, I'm talking about change and my process. The number one piece of advice that I give to students and people who are starting new creative businesses when they ask me how I've gotten to where I am is I say, don't wait to share your portfolio until it's perfect. Show it now. Get your story started now. The longer you wait to share what you're made of and what you're making, the longer you wait to get to your dreams. It's a brave thing to share something that's not your best yet. There's fear of rejection. There's fear you'll be judged forever by what you say or show right now. Today I have to follow my own advice by sharing a story that isn't perfected. It's not quite portfolio ready, it's in process. But isn't that the point of a person's story while you're alive? Change is life and stagnation is death. I'm choosing to be comfortable with the story in transition, a story undergoing change, and I am so thankful that you all came to hear about it. I'm also going to do a question and answer time at the end, so feel free to collect some questions um, to present. When I received an email notifying me that my Creative Mornings talk would be on the subject of change, I LOL'd, and then I made the home alone emoji face. <laughs> I've always thought of myself as someone afraid of change. If on the drive to work, my husband Jason suggests we should have Taco Bell for dinner, I pretty much, <laughs> Taco Bell? I pretty much have a mental breakdown if he changes his mind eight hours later and suggests we should go to Chipotle. Healthy choices. When I was 13, my family moved from Bloomington, Minnesota to Scottsdale, Arizona. To put it mildly, I was not pleased. The first day of eighth grade, I was the only one wearing mid-calf height white socks with Doc Martin sandals while I guess the West Coast had moved on to ped socks without notifying me. And worse than that, it was 118 degrees and I had to blow dry my armpits in the bathroom <laughs> because I couldn't stop sweating. Not a fan of change. As I met with Tess, who helps organize these amazing events, she pointed out that a big part of what I like to share about myself and my work is my process and isn't process all about change so I might actually love change. This is the 40th subject that the different worldwide Creative Morning chapters have talked about and listened to together. The past six months or so, I've been very intentional about going with my gut and listening to signals. I thought 40 seemed pretty pivotal, so I Googled the meaning. In the Bible, 40 symbolizes a period of testing, trial, and probation, and that's exactly what I've been going through the past year. This process of preparing to speak with you all today has been an amazing way to close a year of my life that was really hard. Before I share that year, I'm going to share all that came before it. Here I am at age two and then 25 with my beloved pal, Pony. We've been friends since I was born. Two years after starting May May, one of my brothers suggested I make Pony my logo. And I loved the idea because Pony's spirit embodies the idea of plain pretend, and that's a big part of my process and work. In this photo, I wouldn't stop crying until I was holding Pony. And I'm talking about the photo on the left. <laughs> I've always loved imaginary worlds, friends, and narratives. I grew up in a loving family with my parents who both pushed me and celebrated me, and two younger brothers who let me practice being bossy and love me anyways. I had an entrepreneurial spirit since I was young and found and taught my own students both violin and swim lessons throughout high school and college. I attended Biola University where I studied art and met my husband who I adore, Jason. As we planned our wedding my senior year of college, I made my own wedding invitations and after the encouragement of my dad who when seeing the designs I think finally caught the vision of why I was studying art and that you could do something with the profession, I was encouraged to start a little business and offer my services to other people. I promptly named the business Mei Mei, which means little sister in Chinese, and it is a name my family and close friends have called me. This is my very first business card. I spelled stationery wrong. <laughs> and I kept spelling it wrong for about a year. So if you're confused, Stationary, that's paper, is with an E, and stationary, that means you're not moving, is with an A. Public service announcement. 
to get clients, I would send Facebook messages to people in my network whose relationship status was engaged. There is no longer a feature on Facebook that allows you to search for people this way, and I wonder if it was all my spammy messages and the many times I was blocked from Facebook that encouraged the developers to change. I call the first two years of my business, after school, my unpaid internship. Truly, the story of May May is as much my husband Jason's story as it is mine. As he supported me on his salary of his first journalism job after school and helped me every step of the way. The business slowly grew and took off and I started working with people I didn't spam on Facebook, began to receive press and was no longer just home, but running a home business. The decision to start the business was a bit impulsive. I saw it as a way to make cash while I was finishing school. I hadn't intended for it to be my first job and start of my career after college. I did apply for jobs, and whether it was the fact that it was 2008, I had no experience, or if it was God's plan, I didn't get a single response to any of the jobs I applied to. I even tried to get a job at Chili's, and they didn't want me. <laughs> this is how the conversation went. So you're telling me you've never worked at a restaurant? No. Like not even McDonald's? No. Well, I don't think we can make this work. So I found myself in a very sink or swim situation. I had something that had some legs, which was May May, and so I recklessly poured myself into it, or poured my spammy Facebook messages into it. I defined success at this early point in my career based on what I saw others accomplishing. I didn't have a clear vision of what I wanted for my own life, but I saw someone, what I would see someone else making beautiful things and achieving accolades. I would envy them and want what they had. I had about every stationary feature for Martha Stewart Weddings Magazine ripped out in a three ring binder from about 2008 to 2012. Every stationer I found online, I would bookmark and look at obsessively. A big part of how I think and process is by hunting and gathering. Being that I started a business I knew nothing about, I searched for direction and answers as to what would be next for me as a stationary designer within the web pages and then social media feeds of designers and business owners I admired from afar. I looked at what they achieved and assumed in order to get to their status, I needed to do what they did. Some of these things included the way that I contracted my work the number of proofs I would offer, my pricing structures, deciding to open a wholesale side of my business, and hiring interns and employees. I would constantly change my business based on what I saw other people doing. Additionally, I would constantly change my offerings based on what people would ask me to do. I started May May as a wedding stationery company and gained recognition in that industry and was soon approached by other wedding professionals who would ask me to help them with their branding. I also was approached by wedding clients who would ask me to make them tattoos or ask me to make them websites about gaming, all things I knew not how to do. I had taken one web design class in school and despised it. But still, when I was asked to make websites, I gladly took it. Partly because, remember, I had that two-year unpaid internship and partly because I thought I would make, it would make me successful and respected because I saw other designers doing just this. I'm a terrible blank canvas artist. I'm so much more of an arranger than make from scratch type of gal. I can make patterns for days out of pieces of belly button lint before I can draw an eagle, even after watching million of Skillshare classes. To overcome the Blake Canvas computer, I would create a visual map out of styles to help define a mood, combine different things and visuals to strike the perfect balance for the look the project should have. These boards gave me fuel and gave me time to process and refine in my mind what I was going to make. A big part of hunting for images for me doesn't happen after I've booked a new client. I am always collecting, hunting, and gathering images out of magazines while I'm out and about in books, movies, and traveling. Of course, I love me a good Pinterest and Instagram session, too. When you collect inspiration in this fashion, you have a library to turn to when you start a project that contains ideas and visuals that spoke to you in your gut and truly represent your tastes and interests. 
On the other hand, when you hunt for inspiration specifically for a project, you are oftentimes end up with a pretty stale and generic direction because you're hunting for something really specific and probably just pulling a bunch of things very similar to the end product you're looking for. For me, a gum wrapper can be as valuable and inspiring as an artesian-made ceramic plate. I see the story in most objects and was truly made to collect and arrange items and ideas. It is not about what others say is valuable, but what I decide is valuable. This unique way of looking at objects and images did not initially shape the way I looked at my business and success. Something I was very good at visually, I was totally missing in the way I dreamt and shaped my business. I wasn't collecting vision for what I wanted my life to look and feel like. I hadn't stopped to catalog what would make me happy to spend my days doing. I was chasing down the success I saw others achieve and didn't consider what went into achieving that goal or how happy those people were. This image is one of my favorites. It was shot by my friend Wing, who's here today. This photo is a mishmash of random objects and images that have nothing to do with one another that I've collected for years. I know where each one came from, and all together they give a very May May vibe. I honestly cannot help but put things together in a way that reflects my unique way of seeing things. Like most artists, I find it hard to put into words what makes this May May, but I know it is. Sadly, the way I was structuring my business and the decisions I was making to grow and shift my company did not have the same particular May May or Megan Spice to it, but was the icky generic version based on what I saw others doing from the outside. This photo was taken when I was working with my talented friend, Mary Beth, who's also here, who created the May May movie that beautifully shares my creative process. Here I am confidently pinning up art direction for this film, but on the inside, I had no idea where I was going and didn't know how to handle the breadth of work I was taking on. I'd begin to achieve some of the things the people I admired had. May May was published on every wedding blog and most wedding magazines. I had my own studio space and employees. I had a little sliver of the fame I had envy and worked towards. I had all the pieces that I had determined would equal success, but couldn't have been more unhappy. I had also run a great debt trying to expand the business. Struggles I had had since the very start of my business didn't seem to get easier as I grew. Production and working with vendors was so hard and frustrating as products and mistakes delayed timelines. Pricing was a huge struggle trying to figure out how to bid projects with employees in the mix and I still hated web design. Even with the help, there was always too much work to do, and in general, I had never made that good business plan to guide where I was going. I had a moment during this period where I read an article about a woman I greatly admired. She is a stationary designer, very talented, and I had always dreamed to become like her. It was an article that chronicled what she did every day. One of those, I wake up at 6 and do this and go to bed at 11 p.m. doing this kind of stories. And I realized as I read it that I didn't want to spend my day doing what she did. Not because what she did was bad or it wasn't right for her, but it wasn't what I wanted for my life. And I had this moment where I realized that what I was chasing, her accomplishments and the things she made to get to where she was going, I might have to do how she might have to spend my day similar to how she spent your hers, and I didn't want to do that. In February of 2015, I decided I would not renew my studio space. I transitioned out my employees, and I created a plan to complete some of my clients' projects, refund other clients, and pass some projects on to other designers. I didn't have a clear plan, plan of what my future held, but I knew that the way I had defined success did not make me happy. It was time to redefine it. It was time to change. This part of the project where you're making and arranging can be exhilarating and awful. When all of your plans for what you want to make pan out, you are totally in the creative pocket. It's pure bliss. For me, I work in many layers and piece everything together. When all the pieces fit and there, there is no better feeling, these are the different bits and bobs from a save the date card I made for a couple getting married by the Mississippi River and everything fell perfectly into place. 
When your vision for what you're going to make and the explanation you give to your client of how you're going to get there doesn't pan out, there's nothing more frustrating. You disappoint your client and you feel frustrated because you're only human and how could you have known it wouldn't work out once you got into the materials. I've had this happen so many times and if you're creative, I'm sure you have too. It has taught me to give margin within any project. Give, your space, give yourself space to be a human. Expect and plan for that point in the project where all fails and the time in the, sorry, give yourself time in your project for when all things fail, you have the right amount of budget and time to explore additional options. In this project here, I was exploring making a art deco pattern for wallpaper out of finger paints and it wasn't working. I had to switch to charcoal pencil and I had made I had not made enough time to explore the options, and I was in quite the crunch. I've learned from this experience and many others that you should always over-prepare for what's going to happen and expect a huge part of your process to be trying things and failing and to give space so that nobody has to know about it. When I style a photo shoot, I overbuy on props. And this is such a difficult thing because I grew up in a family where we do not waste. And in my family now, Jason and I will save every napkin from any restaurant we go to just in case. If somebody tells me it will take three weeks to print something, I tell the client it will take six. Gives you time to have something get messed up. It allows you to allow a human to be a human and for the client to not know any better. I had to give myself margin to figure out what was next. I moved to an incredible co-working space called Restore Collaborative in the warehouse district after my lease was up. My plan was to work on wedding stationery, no more branding and websites, and to keep one of my employees. I also gave my decision making more margin. I turned down my very first client soon after moving in after our initial conversations made me uneasy. I used to always say yes to every client. If they paid, they stayed. Soon after moving in, my last employee moved on to an exciting opportunity, and I realized making wedding stationery by myself was not what I wanted to do anymore. That was one of the saddest decisions I've ever made. This photo is of proofs of one of my favorite wedding suites, Marlo. I named all of my suites, and they were characters in a world that, I, that was very dear to me. I had twice gone to New York City and carried around huge Time Warner cable bags filled with my designs and albums, schlepping through the street, rain and all, getting lost on subways, going to Queens unexpectedly, and had poured so much into trying to get these wedding suites into the homes of other people and other stores. I'd poured so much into the business and I had to let it go because it wasn't sitting right with my gut. So I was turning down the branding inquiries, and now I was turning down the wedding inquiries. So basically I was saying no to everyone. I did something I hadn't tried to do in eight years. I made a resume and a portfolio, and I applied for jobs. I spent a month grieving the end of something I had poured my heart into, poured my life into. And while I hated every bit, and also at the same time, I hated every bit of that business, I felt numb, I couldn't really get happy. I couldn't cry. I considered closing my Instagram account, and when people asked me what I did, I would tell them, I don't know. When none of the job opportunities developed into job offers, I questioned myself and my abilities. One of the managers I was interviewing with said that I would be a huge risk to hire because I had such an unconventional career path. So I couldn't get a job because I started my own company, but I had started my own company because I couldn't get a job. Pretty confusing. I was so frustrated because I had made the difficult decision to mentally let go of my baby, to let go of Mei Mei, to do the responsible thing, get a job, and it wasn't working. I threw my hands up. Being I had basically run myself into unemployment, I had to do something to help pay our bills. One morning, I opened my emails and prayed, God, give me something today. One project in inquiry came in. I created a proposal that reflected everything I'd learned recently about what I was doing wrong. I gave myself creative margin 
to save me from putting myself in a box. I bid it in a way that would accurately compensate me for my time and expertise. I was still slightly hopeful I would get a job, so I made the timeline very short so that I could run over to that new office. The client accepted. The gratitude I had at this point far surpassed any thankfulness I had ever had since starting May May. I was at a point where I had had nothing, felt nothing, and realized how incredible it is to get to make things you're good at and to be able to sustain yourself with that work. Within a few weeks, I had booked out four months of work, and by the end of those four months, I had paid off every dime of the debt I had accrued. The emotional burden I carried and the guilt and shame of being irresponsible with May May slowly began to wash away. I was free. But free to do what? The same way I move around concepts and visuals when I'm creating a project, I began to offer services I was excited about and was able to present to people and had the privilege of exploring new mediums and discovering what I was truly good at. I took on shorter term projects that didn't lock me in to too long of commitments as I was working. I felt like once I had given up striving for the end result, that I was truly living to discover joy in using my gifts daily. Things totally shifted. I can't take the credit for even a second. I believe so wholeheartedly that God provides every job that comes through to me. He has literally given me exactly what I need every day, every week, every month. I'm in a season of making a new career path for myself, and I'm giving myself margin to trust in the miracle of provision, as well as confidence in the talents I've been given, and to cut out all things that aren't these specific talents. We all have something unique to offer, and it probably won't look just like the people you admire. That doesn't make them bad or wrong. That's just not your path. This is a photo of a photo, a, uh, photo styling setup, and this was one of the things I've been able to explore, something that I love doing for my own stationery, and now I get to do it for actual clients. I was also able to work with people and to help curate their portfolios and help advise them on how to refine the look and the story of their own brands. Jason and I also had an amazing opportunity to renovate and design our home, um, which was really fun because Jason is also an artist. He is a sports journalist, and we both work individually on our creative paths, and it was fun to come together and make something beautiful. These are the things I never planned on doing, but when I think about how I want my personal life to play out and what I'm good at, this is what I'm going to focus on. And I'm not going to be afraid when I have to change again, because as long as I lean into what I'm best at, I know I'm fulfilling my purpose here on Earth, and that's what makes me happy. The part of the project where you refine and apply what you've made is where you take your best bits from making and arranging and spin it into action. This is the part we all see in the end, but it's not what's ultimate. It doesn't take away from the beauty that you see when you see a final product, but it is not everything that the final product represents. What I have put out there into the world while I was struggling isn't fake. These beautiful moments did happen, but we are all better to remember that any beautiful end product has moments of hard work and struggle that go into completing a project. I believe today, as I am blessed to have this space to process and share my story with all of you, that I'm entering the refining and applying phase. I don't have it all figured out, but I know that I was made to make beautiful things and to make people happy and to help make communication easier. So that's what I'm going to do. I will not quantify the worth of those projects based on recognition, but will base it on what I was able to do. I will base it on that I am doing what I was made to do when I was put on this earth. Here are a few images from projects that gave me joy to create. This is a project where I created a flamingo pattern and it was applied to swimsuits. And I grew up as a swimmer, so that was kind of an ultimate moment for me. This is a favorite print project for my friend Jackie for Munster Rose. This is a backdrop that I painted and designed for my client Drop It Modern and this photo shoot I art directed and styled. 
This is a shower invitation for one of my dearest friends, Summer, that was published in the most recent Martha Stewart's wedding book. And this is the final product of a bedroom Jason and I designed for our home. All of these projects have finality. They end, they are due, the client needs them, and I'm so thankful that my story doesn't have to have a due date. I don't have to have a perfect vision for what I should become because that doesn't exist, and I'm never due. As long as I'm alive, my job is to continue to change and explore who I was meant to be. This is my very first Instagram post, and it's a quote from my friend Rose, who came and visited me in California when we lived there. She's from New Zealand, and she decided to set her career in health aside to pursue her dream. And it was such a brave move. And she said to me when she left, it's time to be brave. And it's time for me to be brave now. Thank you. Megan, that was fantastic. Thank you. So as someone who's had a little bit of time to spend with you, um, not only did you give a great presentation as far as the background of your work, but I can say that um, you definitely have a heart for working with other people and you're, you're quite the soul searcher whenever you meet an individual. So with whatever you pursue doing in the future, um, I just know you're gonna touch some amazing lives in ways that are un unexpected. So thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we are gonna do Q&A. And with that, I have a few notes. First of all, um, I am here with the mic and I will be coming around. And then Saray, raise your hand. Stand up, girl. Cool. So <laughs> both of us have microphones. And the deal is, if you have a question, raise your hand. And you can raise your hand while Megan is answering a question so we can make our way over to you. Um, it's super important for us to be able to get the questions on audio because we want to be able to post them online because there's some awesome insights that come from the Q&A section of Creative Mornings. Uh, so when you have a question, raise your hand. We'll come to you, make your question short and sweet, and hand the mic right back. We'll get as many in as we can. Uh, Megan, while people are thinking of their questions and raising their hand, I'll start off with one. What do you do with all the stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's spread out literally everywhere. There was an inspection at our home today and there was a suitcase in the entryway filled with stuff I had brought to um, my last photo shoot. So there's no grand organization scheme. It just kind of bounces around everywhere. Thank you for the talk, it was great. Um, I have a question, in this world of Pinterest and Instagram and all that good stuff, how do you avoid like inspiration paralysis? Oh man. And how do you, um, maybe part of that is like, how do you make sure that your May May filter is up high so that it's yeah. not kind of a regurgitation, right? It's like a... Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's two ways to do that. The first is, this comes with time, but being able to define what your style is all about, and it can totally change but you should set some parameters of what you're about right now. Um, and that helps you to avoid chasing an inspiration image that doesn't fit what you're all about. And I think another important step that I didn't talk about is the sketching step, is before you go and look for inspiration, have a general guide of what are you looking for and what are you thinking about. And I also think that's why it's important to have a library you go to that you've curated before you start a project because those are things you got so excited to save, and that was, you just saved it because you loved it and not because you needed it for a project, so that's the best place to go to um, because you know those things have already passed kind of your gut test. Hi, Megan, I've got one. Uh, so for someone who's considering starting a career as like a sole proprietor, what kind of advice would you give like from the business side and then also from the creative side? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Someone considering starting that. I would say if I could do it again, I wish I had saved enough money for maybe a year to live off of before starting a business. Um, and before two years ago, I, would, I always encourage people, just do it, it'll all work out. If you're passionate, you'll make it happen. But I don't think that's good advice anymore. And if I ever told you that, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think planning for 
what you're going to make out of yourself is so important. In the same way you would plan for a project and know what the guidelines are and the limitations before you made something, you should be realistic with yourself that you're a human and you have to eat and pay rent and all of those things. Um, so save money would be my number one thing. And then number two is I would encourage you to copy people, which sounds insane, and don't show anybody that you're copying people, but the best way to learn how to make something and how to gain the skills that people you admire have is to see how they do it. So I would say take a project, copy it as close as possible so you can learn what the ingredients are that make up something beautiful, and then take those skills you learned and make your own thing. Again, do not show people those projects. I am not suggesting you do that for a client, but that's the best way to practice and develop the skills that people you love have. Hey, Megan. Hi, B. <laughs> um, before you bid on a project, when you're communicating with a client, do you do that mainly on email, phone chat, coffee, so that you like fully get what they want? Like, what is the best way to communicate? Yeah, totally. I used to feel like I wanted to give people an immediate response. Um, and I felt like if I said, let me think about it, it made me seem like I didn't know what I was doing. But I think the best thing to do is always walk away from the client before you bid and put something together that's really exact in one way where you outline what you're going to make, but also has that margin I was talking about. So if I tell a client this project will take 20 to 30 hours, that gives me space to not have to commit to the 20 hours because I don't know what they might ask me to do two hours before I start the project that totally throws me. So because we're people and we change our minds and because I work with primarily all creative people who are constantly changing their minds. I know to give space for people to change the scope of the project and instead of it feeling harsh where I say, you're changing what we talked about, I build it into the proposal so that it doesn't feel like it's unexpected but I plan for it to change. Hey, Megan. Hi, kid. Uh, what are you currently jamming to right now while you're designing and oh photo styling? Oh, my gosh. Good one. OK, so I love banks. And um, Anna probably maybe hates banks, because when we work together, I would just play it on loop. Um, and I also love Hillsong. And our church, River Valley, just put out a new CD that I love jamming to. I have friends who are singing on it, and we love to just shout out their name when we hear them singing. Um, also, this isn't specific, but I love that Discover thing that Spotify does. It's just, it gets you. <laughs> Megan, can you talk about your watercolor work? Yeah. So I learned to watercolor in kindergarten, and... Um, <laughs> had that praying set that they give you. Um, I think we painted trees in kindergarten where you make like the Ys to make the branches. And I had a client ask me, if any of you are familiar with the company Rifle, um, people love that, she's amazing. But I would constantly have people asking me to make those watercolors and paintings she does. Um, and so I tried, but I had no idea what I was doing since my watercolor education didn't go past kindergarten. And um, I just, it was a, one of the things I think is my strength is I work with my limits and I'm able to make something other people haven't made yet. So I would um, make washes because I understood color and insert those into my graphics so that it would have that texture of watercolor, but I didn't have to actually like paint a person because I have no, as mentioned before, cannot do that. Um, so my watercolor work is truly an exploration of being asked to make things like other people and not being able to, and so I was made something else and it's, people like it. <laughs> it's always nice when that works out. Yeah, I love that. Hi, thank Hi. you again for the talk. Um, in terms of kind of, I guess, going on this new path and changing your image, what, not completely changing, but um, 
curating old work and getting rid of old work on your site or out on Instagram, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, that's a good one. I think that there's something beautiful about showing the history of yourself as an artist and maker. And that's where something like a blog or Instagram is perfect because people understand the lapse of time from when they see a project featured there um, because it'll actually be dated. And so I think that's the perfect way to keep old work up. And as far as a more heavily curated portfolio, I think it is really important to take out things that either you don't want to do anymore or they don't reflect a style that you want to pursue. So when I decided not to do wedding invitations anymore, I had my developer take that part of my site down. Um, and I stopped putting up any new work. And so my website right now is bizarre. And I get emails from people who will say, I see you doing this on Instagram, but that's not on your site. And I'm confused. Like literally so many emails with the word confused in it. Like they want something, but they don't see it on the site. So that's my next task is to figure out how to curate my own old work, um, especially not doing web design anymore and having a lot of that work that I do love that, you know, in the end it was beautiful, but I'm not gonna show it because I don't wanna be asked to make that anymore. Hi, I have a question um, that's not related to the business or anything, but it's, it's, I'm personally really curious about how you organize and collect and engage with this huge database of objects that you've, yeah. like, so you've got house numbers and drawings and sketches <laughs> and receipts and ribbons and who knows what. How on earth yeah. do you, like, <laughs> sift through all of that stuff? Oh, I love sifting through it. So I feel like if it's not organized, I don't care because I want to look at all of it. But I keep everything together in the sense that if it's very, uh, if it's like a, container, a tray, a bowl, I keep those together. If something is a piece of paper, I keep that together. If it's something that has handwriting on it, I keep those things together. Um, you know, it's like a loose organization, mostly for storage, but I think one of my favorite things is when I am starting a project and need to either pull inspiration or props, the exploration of looking at all of that stuff, I know I'll find the right thing, even if it's the, the flip side of a box or um, tearing a receipt apart, things like that, it, it's kind of like I've created some boundaries of what I'm gonna look, look at and that gives me confidence for like what I'm picking. So I kind of think disorganization of it all is the most beautiful part because then you have to look at everything when you're selecting something. Uh, so another process question, kind of going off of uh, that last question, is when you're putting together your inspiration, like in a mood board, for example, how do you balance, and maybe what type of questions do you ask the client to, um, or what's that balance of creating kind of the feeling of a mood board versus specific design inspiration? Um, you know, do I, I want to use that typeface or those colors? And what, what do you ask the client to try to, Get into the, get into the true inspiration of the design. Yeah, that's such a good question, and it's something um, when we were working together as a team that we would constantly struggle with, because you would put something in that you thought was abstract enough that a client would understand. I'm not making literally that. That would make no sense. But they would point it out and say like, "Okay, so I hope you understand. I don't want any bed frames in the design." And it's like, "Oh, well, yeah, but like that frame." bed frame looks so cool with that typeface and that bow over, the, like don't you get, but so I think it's <laughs> partly you have to gauge how specific or how abstract your client thinks, which I think that takes time too when you talk to someone to get how specific they're being about what they say they like. Um, and words are very helpful when you put together an inspiration board so that you can point out what the mood is, what the style is, um, being able to say, well, number three in this inspiration board, we're actually gonna literally make that, but in a line drawing and in green. Um, but this, these other pieces are more to give you the, the concept that we want a lot of texture or we want it to be very graphic. Um, and as far as the kinds of questions that I ask a client, 
I do have a very extensive like discovery process I go through, but I also think there's something beautiful in the conversation and just asking people about their story um, and kind of when they say something that feels very unique and like you don't hear other people talk about that or they get fired up, digging into that more. So it's like a mix of going with your gut and just exploring them as a person and then also having a, a great way to catalog and ask people, every client, the exact same question. So I think it's like finding a balance between the two. Hi, um, what are some of your tips and techniques for being a self-starter since you have yeah. your own business and that flexibility? Yeah, Whew. okay, so one struggle that I had um, was getting addicted to TBS. So I would say, do not watch TV on your lunch break. <laughs> Don't go near it. No TV when you work. I think having really strict start and stops to your day is really important. And when you are an entrepreneur of a creative business, what's really tricky is sometimes you feel like you have to wait for inspiration to come to you. So it's really important to create structure so that you wake up every day and you have a plan of how you're gonna make things and be inspired and you can't wait for it to hit you. You have to chase it every day. Um, and there's a book, it's called The Creative Habit by Twyla Tharp and she's a um, choreographer and she has a fascinating way that she does her process and she's very strict. Um, even though she's an artist and makes beautiful things, uh, it's very interesting to see to actually uh, what's the word, provide for yourself as a creative, you have to have a lot of the same structures that non-creatives have, otherwise you'll never get it done. And I would also say um, timing yourself while you work is really effective. And I used to just work and I was like, when it gets done, it gets done. Um, but I now set 20 minute timers on my phone and every 20 minutes I do a check um, because now I price projects based off of hourly rate. So it keeps me in check too, and I'm not gonna like look at, I won't look at a text from somebody in those 20 minutes, and when the 20 minutes is up, I can like check on other stuff. Um, but I found for me, uh, like I don't hold a lot of discipline, so that alarm system really helps me like stay focused on a project. Hi Megan. Hi. Um, you've had a lot of success on social media, building a following. Can you talk about what worked and what didn't? Yeah. I think trying to find success on social media is such a, a f like ghost you chase because like many of us saw, Instagram is changing um, the way that they show posts in your feed and will be going to a similar algorithm as Facebook. So just when you think you have it figured out, they can change it on you. You know, they owe nothing to us who use their platforms for free. Um, and for me, I feel like what made my narrative on my uh, social media compelling was the fact I was sharing what was unique about me and not trying to do things that were more trendy um, or things people would like a lot. And there's that struggle of, oh, I wanna post this cute picture because everybody will love it versus trying to have like this line and succession of photos that tell what you're about. And so I think there are times I give in to like, oh, I just wanna post this because I want the likes. Like who doesn't want the likes? But I think what's most important is um, just posting things that give people a better understanding of who you are um, because that will set you apart and make you know, not another coffee picture, um, more compelling to people. The coffee picture, if you can do it right, though. <laughs> Megan, we have time for two more questions. I know we have one in the front, and then we have one in the back. Hi, Megan. Um, I'm wondering about collaboration and yes. social media. Have you used um, social media to reach out to new creatives or mm. explore that part of it? Yes, I have. Um, and even before social media, I made a lot of connections from commenting on people's blogs. Um, that was 
when I lived in Los Angeles, I think the number one way I made connections with other creatives was by interacting with what they were putting out there. Um, and instead of the ask, like, look at me, do you wanna do something together? It was more like, I'm paying attention to you and I'm excited about you. And if you like me, you can write me back. So I think with um, Instagram and other social media uh, avenues now, that that's kind of my same approach, is I, I wouldn't reach out and make a direct ask of somebody, but I would show them that I'm interested with them genuinely because of what they're making, um, and then kind of let it evolve more naturally. Hi, Megan. Can you talk a little bit about the your thoughts behind marketing and the, you're obviously using a lot of social, Instagram, Pinterest. Are you actively marketing your business any other way? Currently I'm not, but I've had seasons where I attended wedding fairs to promote my wedding stationery um, and paid for ads and magazines. And for me and the types of people that I work with, I find those marketing um, opportunities not really a good fit for how people find me. Um, and this last summer when I didn't know what I did, that was an interesting time because I stopped trying to share specific projects, um, which is like the main way that I market is by sharing my process and projects online. And it was very cleansing to like stop and get a chance to hit the reset button on how I want to talk about what I do and who I market it to. And currently I'm not 100% sure. I don't have like a specific plan of who I'm trying to go after. Um, just because I'm still really trying to refine what I want to say I could do for them. Megan, thank you so much. Can we give her a round of applause?